Well, good evening. I want to thank you for joining me for this Tuesday Bible study. It is again January the 19th, so thank you for joining us. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to open up your word and pray that you will bless us this day with your presence. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today I'm doing something a little bit different, a little backwards, I guess you could say. The lesson for today is the lesson was appointed for uh, the first Sunday after the Epiphany. That, of course, was a week ago. I didn't address that lesson because Epiphany itself was stolen from us violently by a bunch of thugs and terrorists who attacked Washington, D.C. on Epiphany. And that was, of course, at Wednesday, January the 6th. And so I decided to use, to redeem Epiphany by preaching on that lesson on that Sunday. We missed out on a really important lesson. And this is the lesson about the baptism of Jesus. And so let me read to you our lesson for today. The messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Now all of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to hear and see John. And when they confessed their sin, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate for food locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now one day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the river Jordan. As he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, and you bring me great joy. Here ends the Gospel of our Lord. Now if you remember, when I uh, have been preaching on Sundays these last couple of weeks, one and as we looked at our lesson last week about the church here, one of the things I said that about Epiphany is that we are in a season after the Epiphany. The Epiphany was the coming of the wise men with the three gifts that they brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so I am telling you that every single lesson that we do after the Epiphany will have to do with these three gifts of gold, frankincense, we'll just put Frank down, and myrrh, because I don't want to embarrass myself and misspell these. Okay, there you go. <coughs> so gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so every lesson will have to do with the gift that is given to, define who Jesus is, by the gift given to the king, to the priest, to one who would die, okay? This is what we develop after the Epiphany. So Epiphany itself defines the season and what we are supposed to learn. So with that in mind, what does today's lesson deal with? Most of these lessons have to do with this concept of Jesus being the king. And so we are going to look at kingship a little bit in the nation of Israel. And when you think about Jesus, Jesus was born, there was actually the last king of Israel sitting on the throne. And that was Herod. Oops, Herod. Also known as Herod the Great. And I mentioned on our Sunday service that Herod actually was a, an historically uh, a great figure. Okay? That didn't mean he was a great man. You know, Alexander the Great accomplished great things by the age of 28, but he was a tyrant. He was an awful human being. So was this man. Sometimes in accomplishing great things, people do some of the most horrendous acts. And so this man was, by the way, not a Jew. He was an incredibly divisive leader. And uh, so he did something hmm, that we are kind of familiar with. He created a nationalistic political system where he tried to get the, the energies uh, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the nationalism, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish pride flowing so that they would support him. Does this sound familiar? 
nationalism as a method of getting people to sponsor and support your perspective. So what he did is he started rebuilding the temple. That was one of his major projects. So uh, to build pride in the Jewish people, okay? And so this is how he hoped to get them on his side. So they would, he would become a powerful, mighty ruler, the last great Jewish king, or king of Israel, I should say. Remember, he wasn't a Jew. Um, sounds like a plan very similar to what we have seen in our country in recent days. You get the people's energies and blood boiling and flowing and on your side. Well, it kind of backfired on him in one sense because people saw him as a, uh, as, a, as a ruler who was not worthy of sitting on this throne. And so there was a backlash against him, against Herod, by many people who thought that he should not be sitting on the throne. So religious Jews opposed him because they doubted his sincerity and faith. They could see through this. Isn't it a shame that we don't see through some of these nationalistic tendencies in our country. You know what? It's not about our flag. Okay? It's not about a ruler that's sitting on the throne of being the president. Okay? It's about Jesus. And I think sometimes we Christians lose sight of that because we just want to be so proud of our country and proud of this and proud of that. Sometimes we shouldn't be proud of our country. Sometimes we need to oppose that. And sometimes the greatest act of courage and patriotism is opposition. And so this is what many Jews did, is they opposed the nationalistic fervor created by Herod the king. And this is where Jesus comes in. So these folks who were rebelling against that nationalistic fervor, fervor uh, wanted to coordinate their activities in a way to overthrow not just Herod, but the Roman government that was supporting Herod. Okay? This is the stew in which Jesus was born. And so people were wanting to see a Messiah who would organize the people against King Herod and against Rome itself. Now, Herod died. And when Herod died, as I mentioned to you, Herod had a lot of power. So Israel was then separated into three parts. Uh, because, uh, because Rome didn't want anybody else to have the type of power that this Herod had. So they divided into three parts and gave it to his son. Herod, Herod, and Herod. Yeah, that's right. He's like George Foreman. Okay? He named all his sons Herod. Now you have Herod Antipas, and you have, you know, uh, Herod Ar Aurelius, and Philip, he was also a Herod, Herod Philip. But uh, so Philip was in the north, Antipas was in the center section, and, and Archelaus was in the south. Herod Antipas is the one that we see who was there at the time of Jesus' execution. Okay? So this is what happened in the nation of Israel. And so the people were yearning for a religious leader who was a faithful religious leader, not one of these daggone Herods. But somebody who would represent God. Boy, I don't know why I keep putting an A there. Herod. O-D. So uh, they were looking for a religious leader who is faithful to God, who would pull all this stuff together. And here comes Jesus. And you're saying, what does this have to do with the baptism? Hang tight. Hang tight. Here's what it has to do. Because Jesus, when he responds to the call of John the Baptist to be baptized and come to repentance, rejects all of the political and violent and military solutions to the political problems that they faced at that time. He rejected all of these solutions. He came to submit. Jesus didn't need to submit. He's king of the universe. 
He could take the whole thing over right now if he wanted to. But God has rejected our political mechanizations, our violent protests, and a military strategy that might return power. Because it's not about power. It's about submission. This is what Jesus is doing in baptism. And he is showing us Christians how we are called to live in this world. I am really adamant about this. If you are somebody who is celebrating the violence on Epiphany in Washington, D.C., you don't know Jesus. If you're one of the folks who would like to see violent protests on the other side, oh, believe me, the left wing is just as violent as the right. The extremists, let me qualify that. There is actually an uh, extremist left-wing position called liberation theology. Okay? I'm going to put that down. Liberation theology. And then we have, of course, nationalism on the right side. It seems like the right wing is pulled in by this nationalistic fervor, the extremists. Not all right-wingers. In fact, not even most right-wingers. There are many left-wing Christians who are pulled in because this sounds like social justice and all of these great things. But we're going to take it all over and get power over everybody and enforce God's will upon people. That's what liberation theology does, by the way. These are all about power over other people. Jesus didn't come to take power. came to submit. This is why he came forward in baptism. He didn't need to be baptized. There was no reason for this except to make a claim that Jesus' kingship was not built upon power but on submission. So if you want to follow Jesus, you need to reject liberation theology on the left wing. You need to reject religious nationalism that colludes with the pride of this country. There's no Christianity in that. There's no Christianity in political, violent, military uh, protests. We are called to submit our hearts to God because this is the example of Jesus Christ. He submitted, and that's how he lived his kingship. So do you think because Jesus submitted, the true king of the universe, that he therefore is telling us, well, now that I've submitted, you can go and be violent? No. The kingship of the God of the universe is built upon submission and service and love. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray for peace. I'm praying for you to give up your ambitions of violence, of political protests that create violence. There's nothing wrong with protesting, by the way, in a peaceful manner. There are definitely things that need to change. I'm encouraging you to be involved in political processes. That's fine. But these activities are not of Jesus. We are called to submit. So let us pray. For tomorrow is an inauguration day of a brand new president. We need to pray for God to use him. We need to pray for his success. But we also need to understand as Christians... He will never accomplish the kingdom of heaven because that cannot be the goal of a secular political president. But we need to support him. And we need to pray for an end to violence. And we can never participate in this as Christians. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the submission of Jesus Christ which shows us the way 
of protest. We want to protest, we submit. That doesn't mean we accept everything that takes place. But our protest is not one of violence. Our protest is one against the values of this world. And it doesn't matter which political ideology is being practiced, it always is contrary to the ideology of the kingdom of heaven. And so we stand and protest by submitting to Jesus Christ. <laughs> what an irony that is. Let us stand out because we kneel down. We pray for our president-elect, Joe Biden, that you would bless him and use him. We pray for our outgoing president, President Trump. Help him to learn also these lessons of submission. We pray for a peaceful transition. I'm praying for everyone who would dare protest in a violent manner and hold up a sign saying Jesus is the answer. I'm praying that you would truly touch their heart because obviously they're open to you but they've walled off this part somehow in their hearts by catching this nationalistic fervor that has led to violence. This cannot be a part of our Christian walk. So I'm praying for peace. I'm praying for my sisters and my brothers. And I'm praying that we change this world through submission and love. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.